this uh, lecture so that you can see it within a week or so on our website, on our YouTube page. And um, lastly, what I'd like to uh, do is ask if anyone's interested, if they'd like to, us to continue these kind of programs, if you feel like you'd like to donate, I have put in the chat box a link to our support page, which goes right to our library website. So uh, I thank anyone who does that, and I thank you all for being here. And now I'll tell you a little about Ginny. Ginny is a resident of Bark Hampstead, and she is a master wildlife conservationist with the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Her house is on the uh, edge of the People State Forest, and she observes a huge po population of black bears, and she supplies field notes and photographs to the DE. EP biologists. Um, she has done many different programs in the past, uh, ones including uh, bald eagles. She interprets them for the Chapag Dam Eagle Viewing Area, and she does things with the Essex Steam Trains Eagle Flyer. And lately she has changed um, venues a little bit and has uh, she has a side business called Murder Without Pain, where she writes murder mystery games based on historical subjects and runs them at the country inns around the area, corporate parties and fundraisers. So with that, I'm gonna let Jenny go and thank you so much for being here. Okay, welcome everybody. I, I noticed, recognize some names from before. I'm, I'm always happy to talk for Hunt Library. Uh, we've got a great relationship and Again, I want to give a shout out to our librarians and this, you know, of course includes healthcare workers and teachers, but what a time all of you had to go through during, you know, COVID and figure out how to continue to program, continue to give people, um, you know, something to do when you were sitting and looking at your walls. Aside from also learn, seeing animals in your yard, you probably didn't even knew went there because you were out looking during the day and you saw them come by. So. Uh, some of these, some of the things uh, did come out uh, to our benefit, thanks to the dedication of uh, our teachers, our healthcare workers, and our librarians. So I want to give a shout out to Erica and all of those. So anyway, okay, so I'm going to disappear myself because I have better pictures to look at than me, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll start up. So I got to share my screen and give me a second. Okay, so wildlife in Connecticut's changing landscapes. Um, and changing landscapes really apply to most everywhere in our country. Uh, some of the southwestern uh, desert areas uh, don't alter quite as much as our environments, but every environment does alter and is altered either by uh, natural happenings or by uh, human uh, encroachment. So that's a little bit of what we'll talk about today. It's kind of more history, but also focusing on wildlife. These are a couple of my Bark Hampstead animals uh, that have come through my yard. Uh, of course, you know, Bobcat and Black Bear. So um, I always like to use literature and quotes. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. And as you know, that in the fall here in Connecticut, when the acorns and other nuts fall, those are what we call mast, M-A-S-T, and it's very, very important for all of our animals that are getting ready for the winter. So we're lucky to have acorns. I know a lot of people who have too many acorns hitting their cars and hitting their driveways aren't too happy, but just shovel those up and throw them out in the woods and something will eat them. Uh, so Connecticut landscapes in the beginning, there were forests, not, as you can see, uh, 26,000 years ago in the Wisconsin ice age, uh, uh, in 13,000 years ago, tundra dominated, then spruce woodlands, then when the humans arrived, uh, then 9,000 years ago, pine and hemlock forests showed up, then mixed deciduous, then our regal American chestnuts, which, you know, suffered from a blight around the turn of the 20th century and pretty much all didn't survive. And then 1,000 years uh, Native American ag agricultural begins, which did have some effect, as you'll see on the uh, landscape. So around 500 years before the colonists arrived, Native Americans began to set up 
subsistence farming. Um, they, uh, one of the great American myths claims that before the colonists came, uh, the Native Americans lived in perfect harmony with uh, nature surviving on the renewable bounty. Uh, they were America's first environmentalists, and the land they lived on re remained relatively unspoiled, but not totally true. They would, um, they would alter the terrain with their farming. Uh, they would clear forests, uh, which would help increase the number of floods. But unlike the colonists who built communities, brought in domesticated animals, built fences, and did not rotate crops or let fields lie fallow so the nutrients would return, the, the Native Americans did uh, have a type of crop rotation. Um, recent archaeological evidence suggests that as many as 50,000 Native Americans inhabited the area known as Connecticut, wasn't known as Connecticut then, but there are probably three pretty active tribes. Uh, they would hunt and fish when game was available. They cultivated many vegetables that we do, beans, pumpkin, squash, corn, uh, in areas that they had burned to clear just uh, near the shore for the spring, summer, and fall. And in the winter, which seems counterintuitive, they did retreat to the upland valleys during the winter, and they would just kind of subsist on uh, produce they brought with them and hunting and just kind of hunker down uh, for the winter. If any of you are gardeners, I, I uh, encourage you to try this. These are called the Three Sisters. Uh, Native Americans raised these uh, a lot, and it was corns, beans, and squash. So as you see in this illustration, they plant the corn with the beans in close proximity. So you don't need a pole, the beans could climb the stalks. Then the squash and other root vegetables, they would plant around the base of the corn. And it made for a ve very efficient use of the land, but also uh, a very efficient use of growing vegetables. So I rather like that. Uh, my friend and I tried that in our uh, community box garden. Uh, it didn't work out too well. There wasn't enough room for the root vegetables, but it does work if you have the, enough space. Um, so uh, with the Native Americans, they would clear certain plots of land uh, twice a year by burning. They wanted to create edges on the forest uh, and less density in the woods, and that would allow fruits and berries and, and uh, fruit bearing trees to grow. Uh, they did have villages, they did have roadways, which people don't even realize. Uh, sometimes they would reroute streams, whether it would be to uh, break a beaver dam or, or use um, soil to reroute streams. Uh, so eventually the colonists would benefit from most of this when they came. Uh, so here's some pictures. They hunted, they fished. Uh, I'm told they even used decoys. They made their own duck decoys. Uh, they were very efficient uh, at hunting and at feeding themselves with the wildlife on the land, but not over hunting or over fishing. Um, when the colonists arrived, they were astonished that the Native Americans had such agrarian cultures. Uh, and so they started kind of duplicating that often on land that, that, that they had overtaken from Native Americans. Uh, uh, but the attitudes were different. Uh, it was more self-serving for the colonists. It was survival, but in a little different way. Uh, they did have some indiscriminate use. Um, so they came around in the early 1600s. Uh, our landscape was pretty much about 95% forested. Uh, we have determined that through diaries and other estimates. Uh, there were huge oak trees then. Majestic white pines were not uncommon. Uh, we still have the white pines. Half of the trees were American chestnut, and those chestnuts provided a lot for the people and for animals. The wood of the chestnut tree was prized uh, because it uh, had, was in insect and decay resistant. When we love that for our decks today, uh, it also had many uh, uses. It had made very good fence posts. Uh, was beautiful for interior trim in post and beam homes. I have a 1760 home and uh, some of my, most of my beams in the old part of the house are chestnut. Uh, you can see the little ax marks on them and it's pretty cool. Uh, they use them in churches and meeting rooms. Again, the trees nuts were called mast uh, and they were, uh, the chestnuts were also food for a number of forest dwellers. Um, 
at this time, the wildlife did abound uh, in, uh, in our land. Uh, there, but again, as I said, there were noted differences in the way Native Americans consumed the land and its flora and fauna. Um, they did clear the land, as I say, but unlike, uh, unlike the colonists, they, would not, they did not fear the animals. They hunted them only for food, clothing, and shelter, not to uh, rid them and have them gone because they were afraid of them. Uh, as settlers did settle in their lands, uh, they did uh, clear lands for livestock for their homesteads. Uh, they set up communities more than isolated farms, although in my town of Park Hampstead, uh, it was settled about 1760, which is kind of late, uh, but it was way out in considered wilderness and uh, houses were pretty far apart. Uh, but anything, it's estimated that 30 to 50% of early farms retained some degree of forest because they needed, uh, they needed wood for building, for fuel, household items. They made, you know, their, most of their bowls out of wood, uh, furniture, uh, farm implements. So, um, and fences, so they still needed some of those uh, forests, so they didn't totally annihilate them all. Uh, for a time, the American traders, uh, if you heard my beaver talk, you know, they pretty much used the Native Americans to track beavers, and the beaver pelt industry pretty much helped fuel the colonies and get them out of debt, uh, because they got so much for, for these uh, beaver hides, and also, they got a lot of money for some of the wood that they would send over to England and uh, ships, uh, masks for ships were made out of them, furniture. Uh, so this new world was very, very productive for the settlers in many ways. Um, so from colonial times though, uh, until the mid 19th century, uh, the dominant view of wildlife and its management was kind of dualistic. Uh, uh, wildlife species were divided into good animals, those which had commercial value or could be eaten, or ba bad animals, those which threatened the colonists' safety or food supply. Uh, Americans believed the environment was to be manipulated for man's purposes. And unfortunately, uh, it seems sometimes we haven't learned our lessons on that one yet, but hopefully we do before our land is totally scourged. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, the Native Americans uh, did consume much of the forest with their twice a year burning methods, and they did hunt animals, but they only did it out of survival, not out of greed or fear. Um, I always like to include some quotes of the Native American chief. Uh, we must protect the forest for our children, grandchildren, and children yet to be born. We must protect the forest for those who can't speak for themselves, such as the birds, animals, fish, and trees. One of the reasons I do volunteer and give wildlife talks is I take very seriously um, the protection uh, of our wildlife and our environment because, I mean, if we didn't have it, we'd be much, uh, much grieved. Uh, so I encourage you all, if you have children, grandchildren, to continue what you can, uh, join land trust, get on your inland wetlands committee, make sure that we leave uh, these uh, beautiful resources for the future. And that's all my preaching I'll do <laughs> anyway. Uh, so though the colonists were somewhat responsible for the decline in forest, um, again, as I said, the Native Americans did revere the forest, uh, but they'd move on to other lands. Um, so when the fences were built and everything was kind of shut off, that also not only shut off uh, what they considered prey animals or predators, it also shut those animals out of certain resources for themselves. Um, so, um, so by the time, uh, by the mid uh, 1800s, probably 1820, uh, over 75% of the forests had pretty much been cleared. Uh, old growth forests, which you know are very important for the whole uh, ecosystem, and populations, the native wolves were driven, driven out, the beavers, the deer, the mountain lions, and uh, black bear and deer were diminished. Turkey almost totally gone because obviously it was a food source. Um, so here's, you know, a, a typical farm. We know those old stone walls, although even though it was uh, made more sense to move the stones and use them for a wall, the settlers also would have to put some kind of wood on top of the stone walls 
because generally they weren't high enough to, to keep animals out or keep animals in. Um, so American chestnut, again, as I said, did dominate the Eastern deciduous forest. Uh, and as you can see, they were majestic, you know, not as big as the redwoods, but uh, pretty majestic. Uh, so uh, losing those were, um, was a pretty big loss. And we have tried to replant chestnuts. Uh, they'll grow for a little while. They'll make and so it's pretty sad. So uh, I can't pronounce the first name, but this near you know our boss had plenty of deer and skins. Our plains were full of deer, as also our woods and of turkeys, and our coves full of fish and fowl. But these English, having gotten our land, they with scythes cut down the grass and with axes fell the trees. Their cows and horses eat the grass, and their hogs spoil our clam banks, and we shall all be starved. So that was kind of their uh, take on that. So again, many, a lot of work back then, they didn't have chainsaws. So the typical mid to late 18th century household used 20 to 40 cords of wood annually. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that compares with ours, but uh, that's quite a bit. Uh, oh, my sound went away. Wait a minute. You're Hold good. On. Oh, okay. All good now. All right. It, I, I got a little signal that said internet was unstable, so I don't know why, but uh, I turned off it. I thought I had turned it off on my phone, but I did. So uh, by the late 1700s, again, over 75% of land area had been cleared for farming. Uh, but then by the 1800s, the progress of civilization, uh, that's what we call deforestation then, uh, did reduce the tree cover across New England to as low as 30% in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And that, of course, affects the animals. So another uh, Native American, if you talk to the animals, they will talk with you and you will know each other. If you do not talk to them, you will not know them. And what you do not know, you will fear. What one fears, one destroys. And I think this is really true about everything. You know, the more I watch different animals uh, that cross, I'm, I'm surrounded on three sides by people's state forest and there's like an animal path kind of from the forest to the reservoirs here. And, you know, you watch the animals, you learn about the animals and they're not trying to eat you. They're trying to survive. Uh, now, obviously a coyote or a bobcat might not know that your domestic cat that probably shouldn't be outdoors anyway is a domestic cat. You know, it might look like food to them, but uh, generally speaking, uh, they're not going to run after, you know, your, your child in the backyard or anything. So um, again, when they built their settlements, they just looked out and, oh my gosh, look at these turkeys. They really taste good. So they really shot a lot of our Native American turkeys and didn't totally decimate them, but really reduced the flocks a lot so that they had to be reintroduced later, which we will talk about. Uh, and the animals first in the east, then in the west. So. Um, to the early settlers, again, the, the wood supply seemed endless. I, and that always makes me think of my granny when she came to visit me from Texas. I was taking her back to the airport and she said, Jenny Sue, I don't care if I ever see a tree again. <laughs> so I think she missed seeing the sunrise and sunsets because my part of Texas has some trees, but certainly not thick forests like we do. Uh, again, some of the harvested animals, these for food. And this is a great story. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, General Putnam, Israel Putnam. Uh, wolves were considered such a problem in Connecticut that heavy slabs called wolf stones had to be placed over graves to protect the bodies from marauding. Um, don't know if the wolves would have done that or not, but anyway, they did put these slabs over it. Uh, there were community wolf hunts were common. Uh, the most famous wolf hunt featured Israel Putnam uh, the state's, uh, one of the state's most uh, famous Revolutionary War heroes. He would later become a general. I'm sure you've heard of him. According to the legend, when he was 24 years old, uh, they say that uh, he killed the Connecticut's last wolf. That was in 1742. Uh, for years, a she-wolf had terrorized and killed sheep on his farm and those of his neighbors. Uh, finally, uh, Putnam got his neighbors together and decided to go after this wolf until she was dead. 
One night they saw her one winter night and followed her to a stream six miles away. I'd like to know how they did that. I mean, I guess they were on horses, but I don't know how you're going to follow a wolf in its own habitat. But anyway, this is how the story goes. <laughs> when she turned and entered the cave, they set up a guard outside the opening and they gathered a crowd of men and boys with guns and dogs and they lit a fire at the mouth of the cave. Hours passed, the wolf didn't come out. Finally, Putnam just persuaded his neighbors to let him go into the cave with a torch. So they tied a rope around his ankle and prepared to pull him out when he kicked. <laughs> He's a pretty brave guy. Uh, so the den, as you can see this, if they think this was it, uh, has a very narrow passageway. But then when he got in there, it sloped down about 15 feet and then went horizontally about 10 feet more and then opened up to about 16 feet. He crawled into the cave. You couldn't stand up. And he saw, they say, he says, he saw the she-wolf's eyeballs three yards away from him. I don't know how he estimated the distance, but anyway. So he kind of got freaked out, kicked the rope, and was dragged out so quickly he lost his shirt. Remember, they wore those big tunics then, so I guess that's how he lost them. Anyway, then he crawled back into the cave with a gun and shot the wolf. Then they dragged him out again, and he was nearly overcome by smoke. Uh, once he revived, he crawled back into the cave and then he found the dead wolf, seized her by the ears and kicked the rope and they dr drug the wolf and the farmer out together. Anyway, once abundant in Connecticut, they haven't lived here for more than two and a half centuries. So uh, Putnam's Wolf Den is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's kind of cool to go to. It's in the Masha Moquit Brook State Park. So um, Putnam's Bravery which some called outlandish, would serve him well during his military career. He was called Old Putt. He was a reckless fighter, apparently. He survived a shipwreck in Cuba, galloped down a rocky cliff to escape the British, and risked his life to save a burning powder magazine. So uh, he is a pretty ferocious looking guy, even though looking at him, he doesn't look so much, but uh, one, at one time during the French and uh, Indian Wars, he was a Rogers Ranger, who I'm sure you most heard about. Um, Mohawk Indians captured him and came close to burning him alive until it rained and a French officer intervened. So it, we don't know how much is myth and what isn't, but supposedly that's the story of Old Putt and the wolf. So here are our animals that were driven or hunted out or extirpated. That's a term used by our biologists, E-X-T-I-R-P-A-T-E-D, which means a local extinction. It's when a species no longer exists in a particular area, but still exists somewhere else. So I always like to spell that out because that's the word that's used. And uh, I'd like you to learn these words, but I want to explain what it is. But um, so the last documented wolf was shot in Putnam, as I said, in 1742. Wild turkeys were extirpated in Connecticut in 1813. Beavers were gone by 1842. Timber rattlers, which we do have in some healthy pockets throughout the state, but not statewide. Uh, they were close to exterminated by the early 1800s. Uh, black bears extirpated by the mid 1800s. And from 1700 to 1900, the white-tailed deer, which numbered in the tens and tens of thousands when the first settlers first came were uncommon because of over harvesting for venison and deer skins. They also did marking hunt, hunting and also with the uh, clearing of the trees there was a general loss of deer habitat. Um, mountain lions were killed because they were predators and thus were extirpated from the state in the early 1700s. And you know me again I love this quote by you know one of our most interesting uh, writers from New England. By the time he walked through the woods at Walden Pond, the, the, everything had changed drastically. And he said, I cannot but feel as if I lived in a tame and as it were emasculated country. Is it not a maimed and imperfect nature that I am conversant with? Thank God they cannot cut down the clouds. I always thought that would be a great bumper sticker. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so it's estimated the forest cover in Connecticut reached its lowest point between 1825 and 1850. Also, as that happened, many of the animals, if they weren't already gone from here, 
would be uh, facing uh, dwindling numbers uh, like as today. Uh, a lot of our animals, like even our woodcocks, which are out there peening now, I would encourage you if you have any fields around once the rain stops to go out right at dusk and you might hear the woodcocks. It's, a, it's that time of the year and it's just the coolest thing to hear and see. So, um, but the industrial revolution by the mid 1800s is pretty much what gave much of the land back to nature. Uh, industry and manufacturing placed farming by the 1850s as the economic mainstay here in Connecticut. Uh, those, there were still farms that existed to provide vegetables, milk, and other foods. Uh, so the return of farmland to the woodland evolved on its own because uh, farmers began to plant fewer crops and abandon all but the very best pastures, which they would save for whatever uh, livestock they had. Uh, many of these industrial centers rose around along fast flowing rivers and streams. Uh, my town has a number of brooks and, and of course the west branch of the Farmington River. And there is really a lot of evidence of old mills. I mean, if you look in some of your old maps, which is really interesting, I'm sure they might have them at the library, you would be surprised and shocked how many mills <laughs> there were along all these streams that produced anything from you know, ax handles to, you know, to cheese and milk and all kinds of things you can't even imagine. So uh, Connecticut was hugely dotted with mills. We have a cheese factory uh, in American Legion State Forest. It's way up this pretty rugged trail and you get all the way up there and it's all woods and, it pro and it's not level land. So it never was farmland. It's like, how the heck did, <laughs> did it made cheese boxes? I'm sorry, not cheese. How the heck did they get all that material up there? And we finally found kind of an area through some deep woods that was on a flatter area that we think was probably an old road. But it's really fun to see these old uh, mill sites and try to figure out how they were there, you know, look up the history of them, uh, something else to do. So, um, so uh, as the forest regenerated, though, these industries needed a way. Uh, to heat. Uh, so initially firewood was used, but then charcoal became the preferred fuel. fuel. Uh, it was produced by burning hardwoods in oxygen starved conditions. You've probably seen a bunch of wood stacked up together. You know, there'd be these charcoal guys out in the middle of the woods and they'd be burning wood and creating this charcoal. And uh, that would create uh, charcoal and fuel, which was used largely into the early 20th century. Um, my last part of my career was with the Connecticut Judicial Branch, and I remember we underwent a huge cleaning in our Supreme Court room, which is probably one of the most beautiful in all of the country, and I encourage you to go there someday. Uh, it has some great murals and everything, but, you know, that charcoal that they used to heat with, and guess what? Cig uh, cigars and uh, pipes, tobacco, just made a huge amount of uh, black on all the beautiful uh, work in those in that uh, courtroom. So uh, charcoal was not a clean fuel. Um, so I didn't, wait a minute, it's not, for some reason, oh, there you go. Okay. So again, as I said, uh, by the mid 1800s, it was more, the uh, people had migrated to the West following a lot of the old beaver trapping uh, trails and uh, it became much more economical and the land was more suited for uh, raising huge crops. Uh, so a lot of people went west. A lot of Civil War veterans were offered free land uh, out towards the Midwest. And a lot of people went west, guess what, for the gold rush. Uh, so those fields out there were just richer for supplying food to all parts of the country. And this is, again, what drove a lot of our farmers into the cities. Uh, but at the start of the 20th century, even though there was regeneration happening, our forests still were in pretty poor condition. Uh, so here you can see a change in the landscapes. Um, changing in landscapes is important, not only for wildlife, for the ecosystem, and for us. Uh, and animals change with the different types of uh, landscapes. So um, forests in flux, uh, Connecticut's a 14th most forested state in the United States, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now that's proportionately, you know what I mean? Like Oregon probably has many more 
you know, trees than we do, but they do it that ratio thing. I'm not good at math, but that's how they do it. So, uh, the uh, according to the Connecticut Forest Forest Action Plan, they say this is remarkable considering Connecticut, the fourth most densely populated state. Uh, uh, can have that much uh, forest. Uh, we are 3.6 million acres in Connecticut, and uh, 3.1 of that is land surface. Uh, we're over 3 million people, so it's almost an acre a person. Uh, as you know, we're very fragmented by roads, and that really affects our wildlife populations. It, it, it affects our plants. Uh, it affects everything. Uh, and uh, so it's really remarkable, and the more I think about it, uh, it's remarkable the the bounty of wildlife, the bounty of uh, of plants that we have that are good for the environment, given you know the the um, fragmentation that we do have. Uh, this is only up to two thousand, uh, but it gives you a sense of the growth um, of the forest. You can see in sixteen fifty almost uh, totally forested, and goes down towards the uh, bottom part where you see in the 1850s and then bouncing back up. Uh, we are now kind of holding steady from what I told. Um, it could be a little, you know, our forest could diminish a little more with development. Um, it's hard to say uh, what's going to happen now that everybody's coming to Connecticut and buying houses. You know, they're, they're going to want to come. You know, I don't know if you've heard, but Killingworth has a, a beautiful Boy Scout uh, camp a lot of land and right now a developer is trying to buy it and uh, develop it into high-end houses. It's, it's a very uh, important uh, ecosystem. So there's a March 31st deadline. So we're hoping uh, the state, the uh, Nature Conservancy, some very wealthy person with uh, deep pockets or something will come up and can match that because it'll be a, a really horrible resource to lose. Okay, so again, um, New England happens to be the most heavily forested region in the country. 80% of it's covered with trees. Again, as I say, that's all proportionate uh, to the size in a ratio. Uh, and uh, it's helped bring back our black bear. It's helped bring back uh, other animals, which we'll learn about later. So. Uh, the forests are very important to many of these animals. So here's some young growth in forests. Uh, you see uh, deep, you can see a lot of uh, logging probably going on. I don't know about your area, but the uh, deep does have forest action plans and they, they do study everything very carefully. Uh, obviously they're having to take out the ash trees because they're all dying. Uh, we have the hemlocks have an insect that's uh, preying upon them somewhat, but we do have some little beetles from Asia that can eat that woolly adelgid, and uh, they've released a lot of them here in People's State Forest, and it has taken effect, so that's good. Uh, so all of these, this cutting is not so much to make money off the lumber, although lumber is a high price now, but this management plan was created long before uh, the current situation here in Connecticut. So, and as our lands revert back to forests, some of this wildlife is returning, uh, some through reintroduction, th some through migration. Uh, our uh, bears are back, pretty much filtering down from Massachusetts uh, and other places. Um, beavers are back. Uh, we have wild turkeys who are reintroduced. We'll talk about those. We did reintroduce the fisher. Uh, and again, if I think I gave you the Fisher talk, remember it's Fisher, not Fisher cat, it's a weasel. So anyway, um, black bears return and a healthy population exists. Uh, but for these great magnificent creatures, there's a, a kind of a, it's a kind of a teeter totter between civilization uh, with habituation by uh, seed and stuff. Uh, but their existence here is testament to the health of our ecosystem. So we must strive to uh, uh, let them coexist. So black bear research, we do do black bear research. Our wildlife division uh, called the fur bearer 
uh, division, which means uh, animals with fur. <laughs> uh, they track and tag the animals. Uh, there's a common misconception that a tag bear is a problem bear and that a bear with one tag was in, tr in trouble once, had his little paw slapped. The black bear with two tags was in trouble twice. And then like California with a criminal, the third time you're out. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, actually, every bear that's handled by the deep uh, receives tags, uh, one in each ear. Because uh, these animals are very rugged creatures. And I can tell you, having grown up on a cattle ranch, you have to put uh, two tags uh, in their ears because they're very rough and they have hooves. They don't even have paws. So, uh, you know, large animals can sometimes uh, get these uh, tags out of their ears. They might tussle with other bears. You know, who knows how they get them out. I know one was tagged in my area, a sow. And uh, the next day I saw her, it was twisted around completely. And then pretty soon it wasn't even there at all. So, uh, so uh, there are bears that are caught in this. This is called a culvert trap or a bear can. Um, it has deep within it, it has a basket full of donuts. The bears, yeah, they do have a sweet tooth and they pull on that basket. The basket generally has is not, it has to be pulled by a pretty strong animal. Like it'd probably take about three or four raccoons jumping up and down, trying to pull it down to get it down. And then it shuts that gate you see there. And uh, the vial just get out there very quickly, you know, and they process the bear. And any bear they handle, as I said, gets tags, they'll measure its ears, its tail, uh, check its teeth, you know, measure its claws, check its overall health. And then they weigh it, which is to me very incredible. This is Paul Rigo. He's been the longest of our fur bears and a great guy. And they'll put the bear inside this tarp and with a pole through it. And, and two guys or guys and women will lift it up to see how much the bear weighs. And if it's over 400 pounds, that's pretty, pretty hard thing to do. But I have great respect for the work they do and, and how they uh, keep track in, of our animals. Um, Right now, they're in the middle of visiting bear dens, uh, the cub dens now. They just finished visiting uh, the dens with yearlings. They do this to try to keep a account of uh, the population and the health of our population. Um, our black bear uh, cubs have a pretty good survival rate of about 70% to 75 the first year. Um, they do remain with their mother for about a year and a half. They'll be in the den their second year in the den with her. Then when it's time for her to breed again, uh, black bear cells have uh, cubs every other year, generally, uh, she'll kick them out. Uh, so uh, that's Jason Hawley right there. He's another one of our fur bear biologists. And uh, they take the bears out and then they tranquilize the mom. Obviously they've already tranquilized her here. They'll pull her out on a tarp. Then they get the little cubs. And uh, you know, it's like, all these little cubs want to do is be warm because generally they've been under that big black bear fur and they'll just cuddle up to the biologist to be warm. They don't, they don't scratch them or anything unlike a bobcat kitty, which can be pretty gnarly. Uh, so here's habitat suitability. As you know, the Northwestern Connecticut is suitable for most of our wild animals. Uh, you know, we have a pretty good fisher population. Uh, we have uh, big more, more black bears than anywhere else, although there's a pretty good population in northeastern Connecticut. They are, they are migrating some to other areas. Uh, that uh, reddish area, that's like the Connecticut River area. It's generally and down near the Gold Coast, Fairfield County. Generally, that's not a place a bear would want to be. <laughs> so luckily, they don't go down there too much because you know, there's a lot of roadkill deers down in those very busy, busy areas. So uh, the dark green is the best habitat uh, and the uh, light green is uh, second best. So uh, you guys are definitely in the best habitat for bears. And here's a tag and uh, collared bear. We have uh, just around 25 to 27 sows tagged with these GPS units. They are smaller than this one now. Uh, so they can follow the bear uh, with GPS and tell where she is. Only sows get the collars and it helps them uh, determine territories. 
health of the bear, uh, health of their, uh, they're able to use these collars also to use telemetry and find them in the dens. Uh, so uh, very important. Uh, so anyway, air tag color indicates the year the bear was tagged. Uh, this bear was tagged before the new system. So this bear was the first bear tagged in 2013, but now it's a little different. So uh, a bear with yellow tags was handled in 2016 and one with pink was handled in 2013. Today, each tag has a three digit number code. Uh, the last digit indicates the year while the first two numbers indicate the sequence in which the bear was tagged. So again, this was the old system. Uh, so she was the first tag in 2013. Um, again, this is a pretty healthy black bear in People State Forest, uh, probably 450 to 500 pounds. I always laugh because everybody who sees a black bear says, oh my gosh, it was 400 pounds. I'm like, how do you know it was 400 pounds? You know, it could be more or less. So anyway, uh, I've told you this before, it's important to practice good bear aware behaviors. They're not normally aggressive towards humans, uh, but they are powerful animals. Uh, usually they will flee at the sight of humans or smell a person, but they will become bold if they smell food at campsites, compost piles, and garbage areas. The best way to keep a bear away is to not leave food around, and this also means pet food and bird seed. So while turkeys are a visible species with an interesting story in Connecticut, I, I saw these three on my road and I couldn't resist like, why does the turkey cross the road? I don't know, you can answer that. But anyway, uh, they were eliminated from the state uh, by the early 1800s. Uh, they're now common, more than common in Connecticut and they're found in all of our 160 towns, 69 towns and cities. Um, they were initially brought back to the state through a trap and relocation project. Uh, between 1975 and 1992, they were captured in New York and then relocated in northwestern Connecticut. They were catched with a net that's fired by rockets and it just kind of just opens up over a bunch of turkeys. And uh, once, uh, and then they released them uh, from a remote blind. And uh, once they flourished, there were 300 additional turkeys were trapped within the state and released in other areas of the state. So uh, it was, as you know, probably it's quite successful. Um, now that Connecticut's land is returned to forests, they have thrived uh, and they have the habitat they need to survive. This is this one in my yard this winter. Uh, the forests provide food, shelter, and roosting sites for turkeys. Although you say, why do I always see them on the roads? <laughs> I'm like, well, first of all, turkeys, uh, porcupine, even deer to some extent, love to eat the salt on our roads that have been spread during the winter. So oftentimes that's what they're doing. Um, while turkey hunting is popular outdoor activity, uh, and, but you know, of course you have to be licensed to hunt and there's this hunting for turkey in spring and fall. Uh, sportsmen do help fund turkey management and other game animal projects through the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Program by paying a special tax on hunting equipment. So our white-tailed deer, very beautiful, pretty ubiquitous in Connecticut. Uh, they were almost entirely gone though from the state with the elimination of forest habitat. They do like um, rhododendron, as you can see back here, there's some rhododendron in the winter. Uh, there were a few laws uh, that um, protected them at the time, uh, and they were hunted, uh, you know, for food, of course, and for their hides. Uh, in 1893, citizens of Connecticut reported only 12 deer, and uh, that was due to the loss of mature forest and unrestricted hunting. Today, there are over 100,000 in Connecticut. Uh, that's a number that creates a lot of problems for homeowners because they like to eat your plants. Farmers, they'll eat corn, apples, other crops. Uh, but in many areas, there's many car deer collisions. Uh, a lot are happening in Southern Connecticut. Over 3,000 deer are killed each year by vehicles. Uh, that averages about 1.3 deer killed per day, mostly in the evening and the early dawn hours. So I always tell my friends, you know, our roads here are, you know, asphalt, they're black, even though a deer shows up more than a lot of animals in the dark, um, 
still be mindful at night because these animals are out foraging and uh, you know they can dart out anytime. And if you're going a slow enough speed, you can uh, get out of the way. Uh, some towns that have had the most crashes uh, Trumbull, North Branford, and Windsor, which I'm assuming is probably around along 91, have 11 crashes each about each year, and Coventry has 24, so amazing. Um, we do have hunting seasons for deer uh, that helps bring the number down. It's a regulated season. Uh, there's laws that dictate when and where the animal can be hunted and with what type of ammunition and we weapon. We have used a lottery si system uh, for an extra hunting season in Fairfield County, uh, just because the numbers are so huge. Uh, if you get too many uh, deer, uh, they also get chronic wasting disease, which is a horrible, horrible death they'll succumb to. So uh, there is a need to control the populations. Uh, so again, here they are. Here's a browse line if you look at those. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of plant that is, but they've eaten the whole bottom. I think it might be arborvitaes or something that people put in between their properties, but the deer obviously had a fun time browsing. So, and there's a buck that's lost one of its horns, antlers. So oh, I was laughing with a friend because some of these moose shed, as you know, and I gave my moose talk, I mean, some of them can weigh like 30 pounds, just one side. So you can imagine how lopsided it must feel when they shed those. Uh, incidentally, right now, if you want to go bushwhacking, uh, the ticks are already out, but, uh, you know, the, the deer and moose have shed their antlers within the last couple of months, so you might find some. So we've talked about the beaver. Again, that's an important keystone species to our ecosystems. They were virtually gone by the mid-1800s, uh, mostly because of the demand of their pelts. Uh, they were actually, as I said, the coinage of early America, and they were traded between the settlers and uh, the English mostly. In 1914, they were reintroduced to the state in the town of Union, which is in kind of northeastern, northern Connecticut, uh, to create wetlands. Uh, there were also additional re reintroductions in other areas of the state. Uh, as you know, they do create these wetlands by damming up running water in a stream. Some homeowners don't like it. Some don't mind it. I read a story I wish, in a, wish I hadn't read in the New York Times about two, pe two people from Brooklyn who bought a place in, well, they call it upstate New York, but whenever I look at a map, Albany's not even upstate. It's just upstate of New York City. So somewhere up along the Hudson River, but south of us, they bought property and it had beautiful stream and they had about 100 acres and the house wasn't anywhere near the stream. And of course a beaver came and they wanted it shot. And then a bear came and they wanted it shot. And I'm like, just like people have moved here. I'm like, don't you realize we have wild animals? So anyway, I wish I'd not read that article anyway. So they, they build the dams. It holds back enough water to flood the forest and creates water depth. Uh, and creates many, many resources for all kinds of animals, birds, uh, even plants. Um, but, uh, and so these are important habitats, but sometimes they can cause flooding and trouble with roads. So here they are eating. This was taken in the daytime, but generally the beavers come out right before dark. They do their dam building and they're gnawing mostly at night and then generally are gone by just after daybreak. So many marshes around. I know in your area, there's a lot of marshes you can probably even just walk up to and, and see beaver lodges. And if you hang around near dark, you're likely to see the beavers uh, swimming around. When I said they're a keystone species, it means they have a disproportionately large effect on their environment relative to their numbers. Uh, it's similar to the old style of building an arch. If you pull the center block out, the entire structure crumbles. Uh, so they help maintain the structure of our ecological communities. So there's a typical beaver dam. Uh, so the fisher, remember fishers, not fisher cat, they're weasels. They're very dependent on forest habitat. And now that we do have healthy forests, uh, they are thriving. Um, they did, unlike the bears, they did need a little help repopulating the forests in mostly Northwestern Connecticut to begin with. 
they were scarce due to forest clearing uh, and over exploitation for their furs. Uh, by the early 1900s, they were considered gone from the state. Um, they do prefer large tracts of forest, mixed hardwood, softwood forest for their habitat. Uh, they are tree dwellers. Uh, they will move from tree to tree. They're one of our few animals that uh, will kill porcupines, um, but they also live mostly on small forest mammals such as squirrels and rodents. Uh, so in 1988 to 1990, we had a reinduction well, introduction. Uh, we used the proceeds from a sale of we sold wild turkeys to Maine. Uh, and we use those uh, proceeds to get trappers in New Hampshire and Vermont to trap fishers for us for release in Northwest Connecticut. Uh, they naturally return over time to Northeastern Connecticut from Massachusetts quite a bit of time after this. Some of the fishers were released uh, with radio collars and their movements monitored. And again, as I said, we have a pretty health, healthy population right now. Uh, here's just some, this is the old, style telemetry, which you can see is a pretty big antenna now. It's much smaller, although they, don't, they still carry a box around like that, but they hold a small antenna in their hand and are able to get uh, signals from uh, the collars. Uh, so again, gray squirrels are very dependent on acorns. Uh, their populations do fluctuate based on the acorn crop. If there's a lot of acorns, which we've had great uh, years, we call them mast, M-A-S-T, mast years, uh, the last few years, and the more acorns, the more little squirrel babies, so <laughs> the uh, white oak trees produce acorns, uh, red oaks uh, take two seasons, white oaks can produce them in one season. Uh, they say that white oak acorns are said to be more tasty than those from red oaks, so it's kind of like, did you taste your dog's food? I'm like, Who's tasting an acorn? Although people could subsist on an acorn if uh, you know you were out in the wilderness and you had to. Uh, again, um, the acorns do provide the role in the forest ecosystem uh, that the chestnuts once played, and they're very important food for deer, bear, and wild turkeys. Uh, black bears need to eat twenty to thirty thousand calories a day, so they oftentimes will find some oak stands and they'll just kind of sit there like uh, Winnie the Pooh and shoveling in honey, they'll shovel in acorns. Uh, so 20 to 30,000 calories a day is equivalent to uh, 35 Big Macs. So that's quite a lot of food. Again, I want to mention this, uh, the uh, Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act. It, it is very important. Uh, it is the taxes that hunter education programs with excess tax on firearms and ammunition and archery. That does go towards our environment and towards wildlife restoration. So it's a very important resource. Another animal that's not, this was not native to Connecticut. It came from the West, but it does uh, thrive in forest, uh, but it does adapt to almost any habitat, uh, the Eastern coyote. Uh, if you live in the Northeast, it's usually called coyote. If you live out West, you usually say coyote, both are right. So um, <clears throat> they expanded their range from the Midwest and they're now commonly sighted here. Uh, the Western coyotes traveled East, they came through Canada and in so doing they mixed with wolves and our Eastern coyotes are larger than the Western counterparts. Um, biologists believe they do, say they do have some gen wolf genetic material in them. Um, in uh, 1963, the first recorded coyote in Connecticut was killed in Kensington, Connecticut, which is south of Hartford. Uh, now they're regularly seen here. They're highly adaptable. They can see a hunter from a mile away. And it's good they have such a defense because uh, it's open season on coyote every day of the year um, in Connecticut. That was put in for farmers to be able to protect their livestock. but you're not supposed to just shoot them because you're crossing their yard. And unfortunately, I think that does happen. So um, they, as I said, are highly adaptable to many uh, habitats. They eat a variety of food from small mammals, sometimes deer, fruit, dead stuff, garbage when available. Um, occasionally, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you have small dogs, you should go out with them at night because, you know, a coyote's a wild animal and a small dog is like a rodent to them. So, uh, 
any, but generally, if you're out there, they, they really don't want to be around you. Uh, they, they are in their mating season now. Uh, when you hear a bunch of yelps in unison all together, it's not a kill site. It's a family of coyotes all yipping to each other. Uh, coyotes are relatively silent hunters. I have a recording of one getting a, a, a rabbit, and it just makes one little bark, you know what I mean? So uh, they don't want things to know they're around. So uh, we have regulated hunting seasons in Connecticut. Um, you can pick, pick up a guide anywhere. Uh, sometimes I look at hunting uh, guides from other states because they have a lot of information on animals and everything. I don't hunt, but it, it's a good resource to look at areas and maps and, and sorts of things, animals behavior. So uh, there's our, that's an old one, but uh, our new ones are now just uh, black and white on paper, which is saving resources. So, uh, so early successional half of that is very important. That includes shrublands and grasslands. It's grass that goes maybe uh, knee high to waist high. And uh, again, the American woodcock uh, and some other shrub species of animals uh, depend on this kind of habitat to thrive, the bobolink. Uh, even, the, even the bobcat hunts along the edges of this, uh, these types of lands. So they're very important. Uh, that's why we're clearing some of our forests for that, um, to create that habitat. If you have a lot of land, it's good to have forests, good to have some of this kind of habitat. All of that is good for different kinds of animals. Uh, this is one of my favorite birds, but it's hard to see them because they require many acres uh, to go over and they, they fly straight up and then dive down. They're pretty cool. Uh, they were more common, you know, back in early days. Uh, now their populations and meadow larks have declined because there's less open fields available uh, here in Connecticut. They require these areas for breeding, foraging. Of course, they eat a lot of insects, uh, grab them in the air. Uh, there's a metal lark. Um, they were very commonly heard calling in the field uh, prior to uh, the eight, early 1800s, and now their numbers are, are declining. Uh, so hopefully with some of this uh, clearing of forests, we're going to create a uh, better habitat for them. Upland sandpipers, uh, these are on our endangered species list. And guess where one of the best places for them right now are the fields surrounding Bradley International Airport. Uh, there, there's many to be found there uh, in large meadow. Um, they're more common out west uh, where there are larger fields for their habitat. Again, development along the coast of Connecticut has impacted many of our wildlife species. Um, uh, that habitat is the most vulnerable with a changing climate. Uh, rising water levels, particularly during high tides, will impact marsh breeding birds and other wildlife, uh, particularly piping plover and least tern. Uh, piping, they nest on sandy beaches. I, it always amazed me that these animals <laughs> nest on beaches because raccoons will eat their uh, eggs, dogs will eat their eggs. They're very susceptible. Uh, to, every, uh, to almost everything, even humans. And it's very uh, difficult for them to find undisturbed, undisturbed areas to nest in. Uh, each year, the deep uh, solicit volunteers, uh, they erect fencing to keep predators away from nesting piping plovers. Uh, the beaches are also monitored to let beachgoers know that the birds are there and to not bother them. Uh, very important work, uh, very dedicated people, uh, but very important to ensure that the species continues here. Um, so um, the sandy habitat along rivers is also important. A lot of people say, well, why do I care about the rare Puritan tiger beetle? <laughs> well, all of these little critters, you know, even the tiniest little critter, even a tick, I guess, although I haven't figured out what good a tick is. Uh, well, a possum eats 4,000 ticks a year, so I guess it gives them food. Uh, but all of these, uh, these species are all interconnected and do contribute to our ecosystem. Uh, this beetle is on the state endangered species list. It is also federally threatened. Uh, each year, populations of this beetle are monitored uh, and new areas are explored in hopes of finding new ones of them. So. So again, right now, tonight is probably a key night um, for
for the crossing of uh, different species like the salamanders and frogs going to vernal pools. The vernal pools are just about ready to be hopping. I've already heard some spring, spring peepers. Uh, if you drive like right at dark for a couple of hours, keep your eyes open on the road and you will maybe see salamanders or frogs crossing. Please stop and let them cross. Uh, we, I have helped uh, people in a three mile section of my road where we moved 50 of these animals in one like hour, less than an hour. Uh, so uh, this is a time when they'll be going across. You might always uh, also see some barred owls swooping down to gig some of these, you know, cause uh, they can benefit from this movement as well. But vernal pools are really cool to see. And I'd encourage you to go out in the woods and see them in the next uh, week or so. So again, wetlands, great habitats to visit any time. Uh, they offer great opportunity to view wildlife. And these are some of our great animals we have in the state. There's 84 species of mammals in Connecticut, uh, 335 species of birds, 50 species of reptiles and amphibians, 169 species of fish, and an estimated 20,000 vertebrates. Uh, this diversity is attributable because even though we're a small state, we have a wide variety of landscapes, waterscapes, and habitats from, of course, the coastal plains uh, to our northwest hills. Uh, the peregrine falcon is now back here and is, is doing pretty well, uh, as are our eagles and all kinds of other critters. So we're doing something right, and hopefully we keep doing right. The uh, porcupine has come back in pretty good populations uh, because of the forest. Uh, our bobcats are thriving. We just finished a, a bobcat collaring project, which is really teaching us a lot about the movements of the bobcat, learning that they like our bears and other animals are what we call ex-urban, which means they do tolerate uh, a, a certain amount of urbanization or suburbanization. Uh, I think they're remarkable animals. They're not going to be coming running after you. Uh, they generally will just cross across your yard. Uh, the bald eagles. Uh, last year, very exciting. Uh, we had um, 81 territories of pair, bald eagle pairs. They do mate for life. Uh, 70 active nests, 64 successful nests. They created 107 chicks, which is pretty remarkable when you consider that in 1992, we only had one nesting pair of bald eagles and that was on the Barkhamstead Reservoir. Uh, this past year, an unprecedented seven nests had three eggs, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So again, that's attributed to the environment being better. Um, so anyway, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Here's some more little critters of ours and uh, Connecticut may be small, but there is a diversity of wildlife in our state. So I'm gonna close my screen if I can figure out how and come back. Hold on a second. I'll come right back when I figure out how. Oh, here, start video, okay. All right. Okay, you can unmute everybody if people wanna. All right, hold on now. Jenny, I still see your screen. Okay, hold on, escape, hold on. I'm trying to find a participant, there we go. Okay, we can unmute. If anybody would like to ask Jenny a question, it's, this is a great time. Oh, they're not unmuted, I don't think. Oh, Judy just I'm working on it, I'm working on it. I have mute all, but you can't unmute all, you know? Oh, really? Yeah, as far as I can tell, but that doesn't mean doesn't much because I don't. <laughs> what was that black worm on the on the last slide? What was what? I'm sorry. That black worm on the last slide. Was that a, was, it was not very long, but it was black. Uh, you know what? I have to look back. At centipede? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a centipede. I would have to look again, but. We're pretty healthy with those centipedes, so yeah. we have some slugs too, but we don't have slugs. I remember hiking the Lost Coast Wilderness in California, and I saw a banana slug, and it really was long, really big. You can see why I named them that, but uh, 
interesting thing I learned about slugs, I went to a wildlife certification, uh, a tracking certification. I didn't do great. Uh, I keep trying, but <laughs> I don't know if I'm suited for it. But anyway, they showed us this mushroom and they said, what happened? To, what ate this? What was eaten on this mushroom? And I'm like, my friend is a wildlife biologist. She had already figured it out. They were slugs. <laughs> so sometimes you'll see like little mushrooms will have these little tracks in them. And those were slugs were eating on those. Of course, a lot of other critters eat on them too. So no questions. All right. Well, that was very informative, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. That. Yeah, wonderful. thank you. Okay, well, everybody keep staying well. Hopefully we're we're out of this plague and I can, uh, I was joking with a friend because I used to say what Chaucer used to say if somebody would like be nasty, I'd say a pox on you. But you know, that's what Chaucer used to say. But since COVID, I felt I don't, you know, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I guess it's better than cursing, right? That's right. Yeah, so that's anyway. Right. All okay, right. Everybody. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see. Jenny's going to come back in October because now that summer's here, we're going to be doing more in-person things and being outdoors more. So, but in October, Jenny's coming back with more programs. So uh, we look forward to seeing you, Jenny. Oh, oh and, uh, wait. So Judy, what I'll do next time on this talk or whenever I use the word extirpated, I'll put it up on the slide so you can see it. So, oh, there you go. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank okay. you, Jenny. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.